If you would, open your Bibles now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll pick it up in verse 11. Therefore, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, I heard a couple of whispers, probably didn't give you enough leeway there. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. In a superficial world, Paul wants you to be able to see past the superficial and to the heart of the matter. Verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. Either way you interpret us, we're all about Christ, is what he's pointing out there. For the love of Christ controls us. What is the controlling, activating agent, of a constraining agent of your life? What is it that keeps your moral boundaries in place? Paul's saying it is the immovable love of Christ that, that controls him. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. We don't live with our eyes. We live by our faith, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if he's, he is a new creature, a new creation, The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal Through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Why would you want to be reconciled to him? What is God truly like? His character is on display in the person and work of Jesus Christ more than anywhere else. And here we go in verse 21. He made him. This is what God is like. He made him, his son, who knew no sin for eternity to be sin on our behalf so that we might become The righteousness of God in him. What's the crescendo he's building to? This next part. And that is the same message I would share with you today. I'm going to try to convert you today. All over again. To get you to consider your life before God. And the way in which you walk. So we don't just come and repent one time. We do get saved one time, but it is a lifetime of repenting, a lifetime of turning away from myself. It is a laying down of myself and taking up the cross and following after Christ. So Paul is seeking here in a mixed audience to whom he has preached for months And on many occasions, and written letters to and opened his heart up to and lived his life in front of. He's going to urge that audience, that mixed audience of people who some are real, some are genuine in their faith and love Christ, and some are just caught up in the wave of enthusiasm. They're just singing the song because it's exciting. And some are actually detractors who want to malign and pervert the truth that Paul has taught them about the freedom that they have in Christ, to that mixed audience, he's going to urge them, plead with them to come to Christ. Chapter 6, verse 1, after 
this wonderful testimony of the nature and the character of God and who the child of God is and a positional reality as a new creature and giving us a bit of a, a taste of the goodness of God and the, and the glory of Christ in verse 21. He says, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says at the acceptable time, I listen to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Quoting from Isaiah that Jim read earlier, behold, now is the acceptable time. Paul takes that principle that was given to Israel 800, 600 BC. And he brings, he gives you the full version of, of what they, what Paul, or excuse me, what Isaiah was talking about. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And then he gets into his personal character and integrity. And then what that, that embraced faith in Christ looks like and how much he cares about it. As he goes through verse 3 through 10, as he says, giving no cause for offense in anything, so that the ministry will not be discredited. And he goes through and he shows you all the things that he, he went through and the things he's willing to sacrifice and, and all of that for the sake of the gospel. Everything in his life is wrapped around this. And Paul was still misunderstood. He was still misinterpreted and still undermined. Paul has a wonderful message that he proclaims not just with his words, but also with his life. And that's an uncomfortable reality for, for us. That is, that the message we contain, the glorious message of the hope that we have in Christ, is contained in earthenware vessels. That is, that the message is wrapped up in the integrity and character of the messenger. So if you, yourself, don't live with integrity, don't live in a way that honors Christ, or as Scripture frequently tells us, those who would make a claim to godliness should actually live it out, you shall be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Here we have a deadening kind of silence to this reality. If I'm going to proclaim to people this glorious gospel, I better live a life that reflects it. Some of us are very good at talking. Some have the gift of gab, as my mother used to call it. Well, she's not dead. She still calls it that. <laughs> Some people have the ability to, you know, just win just about anybody over. Some people are good at talking. Here what Paul's exemplifying is, look, it's not just, the, it's not just talk. This isn't something I, I this isn't just like uh, the philosophers in Greece, which they're familiar with. It, this isn't just us talking about stuff. This is us living it out. Paul pushes an audience to respond to the gospel to respond to truth rather than acting like it's just something we can chit-chat about. We, most of us, watch movies. There's a few people that don't, that have, you know, forsaken all of that, and that's fine. You know, you do you. Um, most of us watch movies, but very few of us are actually moved or changed by movies. You know, do the Marvel movies, you know, superhero junk, does that really get you to change your life? Popcorn nonsense. Watching Transformers, has it really shifted you from darkness to light? No. There, there's nothing there to be activated upon. But the gospel is not one of those things. The gospel is not one of those things, uh, one of these truths that can be expounded, explained, given to us, and we can just be like, oh, that's neat, and then do nothing with it. One of the most memorable moments of my life as a wandering sheep, way out, well, not a sheep, a goat among goats that is living wild and living in the world, I still held on to certain teachings of Scripture. And I would still, even at a party of degenerates, talk about God here and there when somebody would bring up a subject. And at one point, I had humiliated somebody who didn't believe in God. 
and a girl looked at me, and I still remember her face, still remember her saying this. She said, okay, cool. If that's true, why don't you live it? She saw right through the nonsense, the hypocrisy, the lie. And I'm afraid that quite often, many people are just too polite to tell you that. When you bicker, whine, and complain in life, in hard situations, what does that communicate? When your master told you not to, what does that communicate? It's interesting. We have a dog, a couple years old now. He's pretty well trained for me. Uh, he loves my daughters, this dog. When they come out in the morning, he, you know, he comes running up, and that's a dog panting if you didn't catch that. He's just all excited. Thank you for giving me that feedback. Appreciate it. You know, the dog comes over. He is, like, wiggling. And he's wagging his tail so hard, his whole body. And this dog is, you know, 70 pounds. His head's up here. He is so excited to see those girls. And he just loses his mind. Eliana over here, she's actually gotten really good at a spin move. The dog comes, up, comes in hot, so excited, and she just spins around him, you know. And the dog comes the other way, and they, like, play this little game. The dog is very excited to see her, but he doesn't obey her very well. Last night, the dog found a little bunny rabbit, little bitty bunny rabbit in the yard. And as a dog of ours would do, he got excited and wanted to kill that bunny. He was hyped. And Maya, our nine-year-old, was, was, no, no. And the dog was just like, what? It doesn't care at all. He's ignoring her completely. Doesn't care. And then I stood up. I came out on the deck, and I said, Maverick, no. And he just, whoa. Oh. All right, fine. He took a little step back, like, and you can see the urge to go after the bunny, but he didn't do it. My point is, if you saw Maya around our dog at one moment, you might think that it was, that was hers. You know, that was her dog. But in the next moment, when the testing came, you'd be like, that, that's not her dog. He doesn't obey her. The dog knows who his master is. He knows I'm the boss. And he obeys. How many of us as Christians, when the temptation comes, we get hyped about Jesus. We'll sing a song. We might blow our lungs out at a concert. I make sure my microphone is off when we're singing. And we might get very hyped about Jesus. And we might sing quite loudly. But when the testing comes, the temptation is there. Who's really your master? Who are you really responding to? Paul is concerned about that, quite concerned about that. This is something that's been growing in my heart over the years. As I've looked around at the American church and I've seen that the louder our singing gets, it, it corresponds to our biblical illiteracy. The less we know God, the louder we're singing. What's going on? What's happening? You have a degenerate church in many ways around this country of people that don't obey Christ in so many ways who are singing louder than ever. What is going on? What's happening? There's, there are dots that are not being connected. And I think this church is in, somewhat indicative of the American church. That the Corinthian church was very excited, very exuberant, you might say. People knew who they were, but man, when they looked at them, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you see the, the kind of sin they were willing to tolerate among their membership, such as would be repugnant even to the pagans of Corinth, is what Paul says back in that chapter. He says, you have that kind of filth in the middle of you, and you're proud about it. Wow. There's some problems. So Paul, to that audience, he has cause for concern. He has need to preach the gospel again. Some have left their first love and need to return. Some never have turned. Some are wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul calls to all of them with the siren song of the gospel when he says in verse 1 of chapter 6, again I read to you, and working together with him we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. 
Back in Isaiah that I asked Jim to read, you read of a people who over and over again were hearing from Isaiah until their hearts got hard, until they no longer wanted to listen. By chapter 28 of Isaiah, they actually say, to whom is Isaiah going to propound wisdom? They say to babes just broken off of the, of the nursing cycle, to toddlers. His message is so simple. His, his condemnation is so clear. Why, just, you know, come on. Nothing's really changing, Isaiah. He did his work during the, the kingship of Hezekiah and then his son Manasseh. Manasseh, we think, through church tradition, killed him, martyred him, sawed him in two, in fact. Um, Isaiah proclaimed a message that people didn't hear because their lives were pretty good. They had wealth, they had protection as a nation, and if you remember at the end of Hezekiah's reign, they thought they were bulletproof because the great mighty empire of Assyria came down, hemmed in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage, as the Assyrians even say in their recordings and in historical artifacts. They hemmed him in like a bird in a cage, and then they cried out to God, and God did what? wiped out the mightiest army of the time, the most feared nation in the world, wiped them out. And instead of that leading them to lives of humility and worship, they saw it as a good luck charm. We have the temple, and all we got to do is cry out and God will deliver. They misinterpreted the, the kindness and grace of God to their doom. But it didn't happen for most of them during their generation. They didn't see the urgency of the moment, and they moved on from it. When I hear, of course, that when he says here, receiving the grace of God in vain, if you're like me, then you start picturing things. Like, what were moments in Scripture in which people received the grace of God in vain? That is, to no purpose, to no real purpose. Gain. Well, I think immediately, of course, of Ecclesiastes when, when Solomon cries out that it's all vain. But those are not the moments that I picture. The moments I picture are times like the Red Sea being parted. I mean, can you imagine being there, utterly despondent, knowing that the Egyptian army is coming in behind you to destroy you and all that you love, and they cry out, actually in despair, not in faith. And God delivers again. And the, the Red Sea, the mighty Red Sea, just rolls up on either side, like a mountain on either side. And they walk through on dry ground. Can you imagine the experience of such a moment? Have you ever experienced something that's so awesome that it brings tears to your eyes? The birth of a child. A moment of deliverance, a story so powerful. It's, it's that kind of experience that the sea rolls up, God delivers a people who weren't even really following him. I picture also when the temple was inaugurated. All the work that went into that generation after generation that did not get to see the temple. King David was so excited about it, he made all the provisions ready for Solomon to build it. God had told him, told David he didn't get to build it. So David said, all right, cool, I'll make it as easy as possible for, for Solomon to do it. So excited. There's, there's this kind of crescendo building to that moment in the life of Israel. If you're reading through your Old Testament, you'll notice that there's, there's this wilderness wandering in this, and the, the tabernacle moves here and there and it doesn't have a permanent home and it breaks David's heart that he is in this glorious home of cedar and, and God's dwelling, as he called it, is a, in a tent. And so there's this epic buildup and you have this tremendous ceremony as the temple is opened, and the celebration, the roar of the crowd begins. Sacrifice after sacrifice is offered. What a moment to have been there for. All these years, all these generations of waiting for such 
a moment, and there it is. You're finally on that moment, standing on that precipice, taking in the view. But the greatest of moments to me to have been there for would be just walking on the road with Jesus. Just a glorious vision of our future and eternity. To just walk with Him. Right? And just, can you picture that? Those of us who've had the joy of going to visit Israel, uh, if you go there and you start walking on some of these ancient roads, there's ancient Roman roads still there, uh, pieces of it and all that, and you start walking along and you see the Sea of Galilee or something, at least for me, that's the moment you see that I can picture it so perfectly. And you imagine, what if, what if he was there, right next to you, just talking? To have been there, to have experienced that, and to only have been moved on a surface level, a surface level stimulation. Well, if you think that, that sounds absurd, remember, that's the, the experience for the vast majority that were at the Red Sea party, that were at the temple being opened, that were walking along, which is the vast majority were not changed in heart. They drew near with their lips, but their heart was far from it. They, they would rend their garments. They would look the part, but their heart wasn't in it. To me, that's a terrifying bit of reality in my own life, in the life of the people that I love and the people that I'm around, to think that so many could marvel, could experience the grace of God, could cheer and applaud something that they don't really even get. It's so tragic when you imagine that, that people could experience such incredible things and yet be not really moved. It's so dramatic. There's a drama to all of it that, that sometimes is overlooked. But I think from a far distance away, you can kind of see how dramatic those moments are. You can look at it and go, how did they not change? How were they not moved by such incredible feats of, of glory from the hand of God? How... How could they not be moved beyond their emotions? But I don't want you to miss it as we view such historical lessons. And they are dramatic moments, to be sure. But I would suggest to you that your decision to walk with Jesus Christ is no less dramatic when you view it from the end of your days. When you view it one day from eternity, whether that be in heaven or in hell, it will be no less dramatic than the people who stood there at those tremendous moments. It will be no less dramatic. I think sometimes we, we imagine our lives to be utterly insignificant. In some ways, they are. Because Solomon was right Living within the confines of this world, it's all vain. It's just dust and ashes. But Paul is also right. On the other extreme, you come to a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, and he says, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So see, here's the, here's the positioning of this argument. Either nothing ultimately matters, and the philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche were right, are right, or everything matters. Everything. Down to, as Jesus says in Matthew 12, down to every idle word, every thought will be brought before God. So either none of it matters, and it's just dust or everything does and look at Solomon's life and the despair 
And look at people you know that have nihilistic philosophy at the, at the core of who they are. They're just None of it matters. Look at their life. Just, just be objective for a moment. And look at that life. And look at the life of Paul. Look at the life of those who have gone before you, have led a faithful life following Christ. Look at that. Observe and learn. At least ponder. If you're unwilling to hear me, on something else, at least ponder for a moment what I'm saying. There is a tremendous tragedy and there are moments in our days when we refuse to follow Christ. When we refuse this urging, when we receive the grace of God truly in vain. So, going back to 2 Corinthians, he moves here he says, of course Paul is urging them. In verse 1, of course he's urging them because he knows how glorious of a thing they could, they could step into. This is the thing that we do a lot of times when you're trying to, I'm sorry, single people. I, I'm really sorry for this. Everybody tries to fix you up with somebody. I know. I, it, like everybody has a, a niece or a, a nephew or like a friend or a neighbor or something they're trying to fix. I'm sorry. We got to quit that. You know, just lay off. Maybe ask, hey, do you want me to? No. Okay, I'll leave you alone now. But the reason why, I hope, the motivational reason why most people do that is because they have a great marriage themselves. They've had wonderful experiences with, with such things. This is why many times you, you want people to have kids if you love your children, it's one of the greatest experiences in your life to be a father. It's incredible. What, a, what an amazing gift of God to open your eyes to how selfish you are, to open your eyes to, to how much you've misinterpreted God. What an incredible thing. So many times you're, you're standing there at the edge and you see someone, you know, Jordan Crane just had a baby. What a gorgeous little baby, right? And you see that child and you see all that potential and you're so excited for them because you know what is yet before them. You, you feel that, that joy for people and you want them to, to enter into the same kind of experience. But you might say, is Paul just arguing from the basis of his, his personal experience, that truth for him? No. It was truth for him. However, the way of God is the most tested, the most attested to way that there is. You have all of this to encourage you to walk with God in newness of life, to have joy unspeakable. You have so much to encourage you in the way. You have one saint after another. I was just with someone who was fading from this world the other day. And to see the smile on her face when she spoke of dying, was wonderful to know that there is hope in that. Look, this is not some kind of blind assignment where you just test out and see if Jesus is any good. Paul speaks from his experience and from the tried and true way of God, the ancient way of God that has been around since Abel, of Cain and Abel, if you don't know who I speak of. It's been around forever. It's been attested to and not just by personal experiences, but by the written Word of God. One example after another, one prophecy after another, one revelation of truth after another, attesting to the truth of God and following in His way. Paul is urging people to step in that direction because he knows all that there is for them if they would but walk towards Christ. So, of course, he urges, and so should we. Paul speaks as a true ambassador of God, one to whom God spoke to, and the apostles as well, and they authenticated their message with miracles. We're not exactly an ambassador. We are by extension because we have the mind of Christ through the Word. But we're not exactly Paul, are we? However, we make the same urgent call to people. To be reconciled to God through the work of Jesus Christ. We also urge you not to receive this grace, this gospel, 
in vain. Why? For he says, at the acceptable time, I listened. I listened to you. And the day of salvation, I helped you. I think quite often we lack the self-awareness to see how proud we are because everyone assumes that God is just there listening to them all the time, hanging from every word that they ever have to say, and that there never needs to be any kind of advocacy or mediator between us and God, that God is just sitting around like Santa Claus, just hanging out like, what do you want from me? And you fail to see the message of the Old Testament that there has to be a way provided because we don't deserve an audience with Him. We ignore places like Proverbs when it tells us that the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to God, that there has to be a, a true sacrifice offered for us in order for us to have an audience. So the fact that God listens to us is a miracle. That should not happen. Do not become entitled to an audience with God. Instead, glory in that. Be amazed by that. At the acceptable time, at the right time, I listen to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Paul then brings that into his context with the Corinthians. He says, look, that's what the word behold is, look. And he says that word twice, look, now is the acceptable time. Look, behold, now is the day of salvation. Procrastinate no longer. If you fall under the hearing of his words, procrastinate no longer respond. And he's not talking necessarily because you might die tomorrow. He's speaking because this is the unfold, in the unfolding drama of redemption, we have reached this final stage of God's kindness and mercy. His wrath is coming. His judgment is coming. But right now, the day of salvation is here. Same message he preached, if you'll turn with me over to Acts chapter 17. This is Paul somewhat explaining or repackaging what he said to the people on Mars Hill at Athens, just 50 miles from Corinth, just down the road, you might say, from Corinth. Paul stands in verse 22 of chapter 17 of Acts, he stands in the midst of the Iraq. I can't even say the word right now, Areopagus. <laughs> and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. Now you picture the scene here. Paul is standing in an amphitheater type of setting, the whole mass of people around him, and he's standing there in the middle, kind of like I am, except this, everything would have been lifted up around him. And he's crying out to them. All these people are as it said back in verse 21, just spend their time doing nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And Paul now is going to declare to them actual truth instead of just philosophy. And he says, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. You clearly have a concern for the gods. That's what he's pointing out. Sometimes when you watch modern movies that try to picture the ancient world, they make it very uh, secular. They remove the gods in so many ways from their conversations and from their, their decorations even. It's everywhere in the ancient world. Paul is pointing that out. I notice that you're very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through, verse 23, and examining the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown god. So see, the pagan lives with that kind of fear. Maybe there's a god I've missed because the gods don't speak. They don't intervene into history. Not like our God. Their gods were ways they interpreted nature, way they interpreted weird happenstances in life. They lived in a darkness, but ours is a way of light. He says further, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, and, they would, and that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, 
though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of men. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. What happened at Calvary in Jerusalem was not done in a corner. It was being sounded announced all over the world during the time of eyewitnesses. And these people received mainly, they received the grace of God in vain, as Paul urged with them there. As he gave them a taste of the truth, they instead were offended at what he said. Verse 32, and when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, and it's no different in our day. Many will like Jesus up to a point. I would say most everyone likes Jesus until you let Jesus define himself. Then we turn back. Back in 2 Corinthians, let me read it one last time. Paul says he's working together with God as he's pictured himself as a laborer in God's field before. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Working together with him, we urge you not to receive this grace of God in vain. At the acceptable time, I listened to you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. What more do you need from God to follow Christ? What more could he have done? He made a public display of his own son. He proclaimed throughout history his truth. What will you do in response? Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you that we can consider our ways, that we can consider your truth. May we respond to the gospel that has once for all been handed down to us, that you made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you, Lord. May we not receive your grace in vain. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't know what